a tough question. Okay. Can you just say your name? Hi, I'm Steve Blyler. And spell your first and last name for me, Steve. S-T-E-V-E-N, Stephen Blyler, B as in boy, L, E I L E R. Any position here at the college? I'm a professor of mathematics and statistics at Portland State University. Uh, first of all, how did you even get interested in this uh, eclipse thing? I've been an amateur astronomer all my life. Ever, four years old, I fell in love with the stars and mathematics, and I, I still have that all these many years later. And uh, you know, it seems kind of complex to figure out how to mathematically figure out where the next when the next eclipse is going to be and where it's going to be. How, how do you even go about doing that? It's really just the sort of mathematics that you learn in grade school and an understanding of what we in music would call harmony. When is it that various tones, frequencies, line up with each other? So how do people figure that out? Where do you start? Do you have to have a special laser from the moon and all that sort of thing? No, you can start in your, in your backyard with a conveniently placed uh, a pole, maybe a tetherball pole or maybe a light pole across the street and a good timepiece so that you know uh, when things are happening. And if you have the same place to sit every night, you can pick a celestial object like the sun or the moon or a bright star or one of the planets, and you just time when it goes by that pole. Uh, the other thing, if you have some way to measure angles, a uh, protractor or um, even just two pieces of wood with a single nail stuck between it so that you can measure the angle between the horizon and the object you're looking at when it goes through past your pole. Uh, that's all you need to do enough measurements for you to be able to see an eclipse coming. Our latest 58 days of weather, for example, if no one told me there was going to be a total eclipse of the sun on the 21st of August, I would have known that there would have been, maybe not 60 miles south of my location, but I would have known that on the 21st, on the, on the new moon, that the earth and the moon and the sun were going to line up, uh, much the way that my little model here is lined up for you now. <laughs> Uh, this is the sort of way that during a total eclipse of the sun, uh, the way the earth and the moon and the sun line up, typically, of course, you know, it's like this or like this. But every once in a while, things line up just right so that the shadow of the moon actually winds up on the surface of the earth. And then that happens, we say we're having a total eclipse. And these things happen with a regular frequency and a regular rhythm because the Earth goes around the Sun in a regular amount of time, the Moon goes around the Earth in a regular amount of time. And the question is, when does the geometry all sync together? And we like to think of, since everything is moving, we like to think of like a strobe light that freezes the motion, that just shows us where everything is. And then we can ask ourselves, is one of these alignments coming up? And how soon might it be? Did one of them happen in the past? How long ago? Will one happen in the future? How much? And for that, we just need to know a few numbers and then sort of plug them into our knowledge of harmony. Okay? So there must be some kind of a mathematical, you must have to know a lot about where the sun and the moon are going to be. And how do you, where do you get the basic fundamental knowledge to even start with? Well, basically, you sit in your backyard and, let me set this down, please. Basically, you get that knowledge by just sitting in your backyard and looking at the heavens. It's totally free. And again, all you need is a vertical stick, a reasonable timepiece. That can be the two bright stars in the bucket of the Big Dipper, which actually form a giant clock. So if you're at Rooster Rock or in Rowena, out where there's a nice clear sky, all you need is a vertical stick and a place to sit. And you just need to know where something is once and then some time later when it reappears there. That gives you how fast its apparent motion is in the heavens. And that's all you need to know. For example, to do eclipses, there are sort of three numbers we need to know. And basically, there are three different kinds of months. And they talk about the three different kinds of months. And they come from the way that the moon goes around the Earth 
uh, in a big fat oval. Everybody likes to think it's a circle, but it's not. It's really an oval, and it's, it's what's called an ellipse, technically. And things that it's easy to measure that in our last 58 days of clear weather here in Portland, you could have measured yourself right from the backyard. You could measure the time from the new moon to the new moon. In other words, when does the moon actually line up with the same position that the sun is in going around the heavens? When do they line up? That's called the synodic month. That's a $10 word for a one cent concept. Uh, and that actually works out to be 29 and a half days. But of course, the more accurate your watch is, you get a much better number, okay? So that's one number we need to know. Another number we need to know is, let's not imagine we were sitting on the Earth looking out. Let's imagine that we were above the Earth looking down, as I've drawn it here. And another kind of month that we would talk about is we can look where the moon is closest to the Earth. It's got another $5 word called a perigee. That's when the moon is closest to the Earth in its orbit. And we can tell that by the size of the moon. The closer it is, the bigger it looks. So we can actually time that month. And it turns out that that month is quite a bit shorter, 27 and a half days. Why is that? That's because as the moon is going around the Earth, here, I'll turn it so you can see it. As the moon is going around the Earth like this, the Earth is going around the sun like that. So to line up again, the moon actually has to go a little bit further to line up with the sun to be a new moon again. So it's actually a much shorter month to go from closest approach to closest approach than it is to go from new moon to new moon. And this is something, again, that you can measure in the privacy of your own backyard here in Portland. All we need is good, clear weather. And for the last 58 days, we've had that. And so it's the sort of thing that amateur astronomers would sort of typically do. You would note in your little logbook, where is the moon right now this evening? For us, it's important to think of a third kind of month. And that's because we want the moon to come between the Earth and the sun, or the Earth to come between the moon and the sun in the case of a lunar eclipse. That means that the moon and the Earth and the sun have to lie in a common plane, a common flat sheet. Well, don't they? No, they don't. As it turns out, the orbit of the moon, the moon's orbital plane, doesn't line up with the Earth-Sun plane. It's actually angled by about five degrees. So they don't line up. So it is only when the moon is in this area where those two planes cross, something called a node, that's what this is right here. This is a node. It's only when the moon is close to one of those that we have an eclipse. Well, as it turns out, to have an eclipse, there's a little interval uh, that is about 34 degrees wide. So that's the angle in the sky, how wide it is. It's about 34 degrees wide, where if the moon happens to be in that 34 degrees when the sun is there, you get an eclipse. Okay? So the question is, how long does the sun lie in there as we travel around it and look at it out in the sky? Well, the sun moves about one degree a day. So to go through what's called an eclipse season, it takes about 34 days for the sun to go through it. Well, the moon goes around in 27. So every eclipse season, you're going to have at least one eclipse in there. You might have two if, there, if the moon goes through here. Only one, of course, if the moon is real close to the node. So this tells us that every year, every eclipse season, there are always two eclipses. Always. Somewhere on the Earth, you can see an eclipse twice a year. Okay? Eclipses are actually quite common. There can be as many as seven in a given year. It just depends on their relative geometry. Now, once you know what is coming, it's easy to tell, because of the music of the spheres, so to speak, when the next one in your area is going to show up. That's because 
these periods, these are the tones of the moon, if you will. These are the three notes the noon is making. This is its chord. Well, they have a rough least common multiple. In other words, if I take 223 new moons, 242 node moons, 239 perigee moons, well, son of a gun, that works out to be the same number of days and almost the same number of hours for all of those three multiples. I've multiplied it out for you here. 6,585 days, 7 hours, 43 minutes in the case of the new moons to the new moons. <coughs> About 5 hours longer for the perigees to perigee. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us every 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours, an eclipse very similar to the one that we just witnessed is going to occur in roughly the same place. What does the eight hours tell us? That says it's going to be moved one third of the way around the Earth, because 24 hours in a day. So that means that every three of those, or one exelegimus, okay, which is 54 years and 34 days, we're going to have an eclipse virtually identical to the one that we just witnessed only twisted a little bit further north or a little bit further south, whether on this is a descending node where things are going down or an ascending node where things are going up. So about 54 years and one month from now, you should be making your reservations in British Columbia because they're going to have a total of eclipse of the sun there, much like the one we're going to have on Monday. Now that's, that's one other question. Is you bet. You know, into the history of man's relationship to eclipses when they first discovered them, when they were first shocked by them, when they first started analyzing them and figuring out when they would be? Yeah, this happened, I mean, 2,000 years uh, before the Christian era even began, uh, the civilizations in China and Babylonia and in the Mediterranean were noticing uh, lunar eclipses. Uh, the moon suddenly turns copper colored. Uh, these are hard to miss because you can see them over half the Earth, uh, so they're, 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 easy to, they're easy to spot. And they, because they understood the motions, I mean, they didn't have all the light pollution we have now. I mean, they could see where things were. They could count out these cycles, and they could actually predict when the next eclipses were coming. Now, since the populace would get all in an uproar over this, I mean, a devil is eating the moon, or worse, in a solar eclipse, uh, a dragon is eating the sun, uh, the priesthood, or the ones who could do the arithmetic, they tended to keep this secret. They didn't want the sort of general population to know that this was just a regular occurring phenomena, and so they could use this to time rituals, uh, you see it dramatized in the movie all the time. I shall bring darkness down in the middle of the day. Uh, Mark Twain used this to great effect in a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. Uh, the fact that he knew a total eclipse of the sun was coming. Uh, but it's the sort of thing that the priesthood, the people who would regularly observe the heavens looking for signs, uh, and the signs would be things like these lining up of uh, the earth and sun. And again, you don't need a lot of accuracy in order to predict lunar eclipses because half the earth sees them. So if you want to predict a lunar eclipse, that's actually pretty straightforward. We could do that in a science class in fourth grade. We could sit down and predict the next five lunar eclipses we could see from Portland. Wouldn't be hard at all. Um, solar eclipses are a little trickier because this path of totality is only about 60 miles wide at best and um, covers maybe 1% of the Earth's surface uh, for the whole duration of the eclipse when 70% of the Earth is water and so it's a lot harder to you know, put your fingers on there. But again, once you have one of them, you can get all the rest one in what's called the Cero cycle. And again, at any given time, there are about 40 active serocycles uh, running. So again, 
Lunar eclipses, quite common, lots of people can see them. Solar eclipses, they can be as close together as one month. Typically, they're more six months apart. 65% of our solar eclipses are separated by six months. But another 25% are separated by five months, and about 10% of the eclipse pairs are separated by less than 30 days. It's really quite remarkable when you think about it. I think that's good. That's when the eclipse is happening. You can, here's, here's the motion of the eclipse. You can see the shadow actually move across the globe if you look carefully. It's not to scale, of course. And we talked earlier about what's happening as the moon is going around the Earth, the Earth is going around the sun. And so by the time the moon makes a full revolution in its own orbit, it's not quite up to lining up with the sun because the moon, Earth, rather, has moved along its orbit. So it actually has to travel a little bit further. This was the reason that the new moon to new moon or synodic month is longer than either the node to node or closest approach to closest approach months uh, that we would get by looking down on the system from above. Can I do this again? So this is, this is the way, if we're looking from above, maybe you want a shot from above, sure. you can kind of see how the Earth goes around the sun, and of course is what's happening is the moon is going around the Earth at the same time. So, right. you guys, this is from our math lab, the Mildred Bennett Mathematics Laboratory here at Portland State University, where you can find a, uh, and instructors uh, and the public can find all sorts of marvelous mathematical manipulatives to illustrate um, all kinds of great mathematical concepts in art, in music, uh, and in architecture. Uh, we have a fabulous collection, thanks to Ms. Bennett, and it's really a wonderful resource here. Now it goes up 5%? 5%, yeah. The, that's the angle between the moon's orbital plane and the Earth's sun plane. That's about a 5% angle. And so if you think of the moon as being a little circle here, it's only when it gets sort of close enough does it actually cross the Earth's sun plane. And I think I've just conveniently erased what you that's wanted right. to. <laughs> that you wanted. It really is the music of the spheres. I hope I made that point clear enough. It, it really is. And of course, what we didn't talk about is lining this up with the calendar, because in that 18 years, there might be four leap years, there might be five leap years. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Exactly. They actually decide what day on the calendar does this happen. Mm -hmm. That's a whole nother, yeah. you know, <laughs> that's a whole nother thing you have Take to do. Down right, down right. publishes uh, the table of where everything is in the US heavens. Naval the U.S. Naval Observatory. They're the ones with the final answer. They're the ones that tell you, they're the ones who give you the numbers we all rely on. And, now, and those numbers, they strive to be as accurate as possible because that's how everybody bases their celestial navigation. Whoa, so it's related to navigation. Yes, the position of the stars in the heavens mm -hmm. uh, tell, you, uh, tell you your local time and your position on the Earth. Uh, if you have a clock that tells you the time in, say, London or Washington, D.C., uh, and you can determine your local time, that tells you your longitude. Mm 